So um, yeah, good afternoon, everyone, and many thanks for joining this session. My name is Franziska Müller from University of Hamburg, and I will act as the chair of the session. In the next hour, our aim is to zoom in on energy transitions and climate dialogues and share perspectives from very different regions. Still, the common denominator in our is our interest in mapping the course of transitions and transformations. How are various actors engaging in climate and energy dialogues? What forms of polit political change can we, sh can we find? How just or unjust are energy transitions processes? And are questions of social and ecological justice addressed at all? So um, what we want to do in the next hour is to engage in a conversation on, on questions of climate and energy justice in the global south, pace and content of climate dialogues, transformations and political struggles. And before we start, I would like to quickly introduce our participants. We have Felipe Coral Montoya from Technical University in Berlin. He's a member of the research group Coal Exit and his works center in on the connection between power and transitions towards sustainability. He is especially interested in Afro-Caribbean and indigenous activism, resisting the expansion of coal mining in Colombia and all the more, I'm very curious what he's going to present us with a Colombian community perspective on energy transitions and a focus on gender, territory and community sovereignty. Second, there is Alisa de Moraes Amorim Bogas, who is currently an Alexander von Humboldt Fellow with roots at the LSE and in Rio de Janeiro. And she will share her views on interreligious dialogues on climate change and climate protection in Brazil. And lastly, in my own presentation, I will speak about a comparative mapping of African transition scenarios. And I will concentrate on ways in which African renewable energy policies consider energy justice perspectives. So without much more ado, I will give the floor over to Felipe. I will try to be a strict moderator and everyone will have 10 minutes for presentation. You'll have all three presentations in a row so that we have enough time for debate. Just a brief, um, brief mention on housekeeping. I will have a look at the chat and I will pick questions for debate, which we then can further, further address in the Q&A afterwards. Also, when you're entering the Q&A, you can also use the blue hand in case you want to raise a question, and I will also take care of the moderation. So, um, Philippe, please go on. The floor is yours. Perfect. Thank you very much for, for that very kind introduction. So today I will gonna present uh, on an ongoing research and, and pedagogical efforts uh, that we've titled Energy Transitions from Below an analysis on gender, territory, and community sovereignty with four Colombian communities. I'm only one of several co-authors of, of this research that was conducted with several uh, uh, research institutions, but also civil society organizations in Colombia. So to begin, I want to, to uh, give a, a short introduction and motivation. And I want to start with this quote that says, a rapidly reducing coal-based power generation and a global phase out by 2040 is the single most important step to keep the door open for achieving the Paris Agreement. This shows us that the coal, that the persistence of large of coal extraction constitutes a key obstacle to reach uh, climate goals. In this setting, uh, it is important to know that Colombia is the world's fifth largest coal exporter and has enough research to continue doing so for a, a very long time. Colombia exports over 90% of the coal it extracts with profound social and environmental impacts. And so far, government uh, policy is uh, still aiming to expand coal extraction and given the uh, problems that have been caused by uh, the pandemic, is now trying to do everything in its power to sustain or prolong uh, this sector as long as it can. Uh, given that foreign markets are retreating domestic consumption and uh, uh, coal exports reinvented, for example, using the idea of neutral coal, uh, saying that if uh, enough trees are planted, Colombian coal will be, will be green. But the highest danger is that the energy transition we receive is actually a, a transition towards even more fossil-based um, uh, te technologies. In this setting, we know that uh, while coal export 
effects and extraction are collapsing, as you see in the in the left hand uh, figure. Um, companies are trying to lower social and environmental standards to reduce cost while also slashing employment. In fact, the biggest uh, uh, coal mine uh, is currently at a minimum and almost close to to minor strike and already four coal mines are already either fully stopped, closed or bankrupt. All this occurs at a time when the long-standing struggles by indigenous Afro-Caribbean and Campesino communities supported by domestic and international NGOs have produced an array of court rulings either heavily increasing um, or uh, completely prohibiting uh, mining companies uh, from proceeding with their extraction. Mm, this would not necessarily be the end of coal uh, extraction in Colombia, but uh, it suggests that uh, this, this uh, phase out of coal is, uh, despite what others may, may uh, uh, object, very uh, present in the horizon. Combined with, with these negative long-term market perspectives, we think that rather sooner than later, this activity may end. And hence, we, can, we come to uh, the place where, where we uh, uh, conduct our activities. We engage in a pedagogical and research process called Community Reexistence, Energy Transition, Sovereignty and Gender, carried out with women, group and, and, and social leaders in the Waju indigenous reservations of Loma Mato and Provincial in the northern part of, of Colombia in La Guajira, um, with the Afro-descendant community of La Sierra, uh, a little bit southern from that, and the campesino community of Mongi in Boyacá. Uh, those, these three are some of the largest uh, coal-producing regions in Colombia. This process was conceived from the perspective of popular education, uh, for example, looking at, at Pablo Freire and, and, and Mejia. It was conceived as an exercise in knowledge exchange between the experiences and needs of the participating women and the proposal to articulate their reflections and actions in order to understand their vision of a just energy transition. A training program composed of five modules was carried out, starting from three axes, relational, a relational gender approach, territory, and community sovereignty. Bearing in mind that coal mining occurring on very different scales has a presence in these communities, for example, in the northern parts, it's large-scale coal mining, while in Mongi, in the interior of Colombia, it was rather small-scale or medium-scale mining. And we sought to orient the reflection around the project of re-existence beyond coal extraction. During that process, the participants analyzed and reached conclusions on issues such as cultural constructions of gender, uh, identification and attachment to the territory, amongst others. You can find these results in, in the link that I posted before, uh, uh, below. Due to mobility restrictions which arose from the global health crisis uh, of, of, of this year, it was necessary to carry out the process completely virtually. The pedagogy team consisted of three facilitators and four local multipliers. For each module, the work on instructions were communicated through informative booklets or videos sent via WhatsApp uh, and other uh, similar formats. And uh, participants from each community were divided into groups of maximum five people in order to carry out the exercises of each module. And afterwards, in a second instance, they socialized the products made and the emerging ideas with the rest of the participants through shared uh, WhatsApp channels, but also phone calls and video conferences. At the end, we produced an array of radio um, outputs that were broadcasted to the different um, members of the communities. So what's the research question that we were uh, coming uh, up with after we conducted this research um, or this, this exercise? We wanted to know that uh, if the question is not whether a cold phase will eventually happen, we don't know when, uh, but, but uh, uh, we also don't know how, uh, our research was to identify, spell out, and visualize the expectations that local communities affected and sometimes engaged in coal extraction have for an unfolding phase of, in, uh, of coal extraction in Colombia. And hence we ask what impulses are identified from these communities uh, to develop one or several energy transitions at the national and local level that are fair, inclusive, and truly democratic. To this purpose, we use three analytical lens. First, we, we looked at it from the perspective of a so-called relational gender focus. This, this uh, lens refers to an approach that explicitly acknowledges the role of patriarchy understood as a system of imaginaries and practices 
thought from the masculine logics and that assigns according to sex and in a differential way to males and to human females, that is to men and women, certain identities and social roles in advantage for men, meaning for women discrimination and many types of violence. So hence, we identify differentiated impacts that activities such as coal mining has uh, had or historical also uh, on women and we consider the role of new gender dynamics for just and truly sustainable transitions. The second lens uh, is a territory. In our paper, we follow the definition that territory is uh, that place of social relations where cultures have taken root and the possibility of living with dignity is defended. This is not limited to space and its physical elements, including so-called natural resources. The territory integrates a set of cultural, historical, religious, spiritual, sociopolitical, and economic meanings that are constantly assigned and developed by the communities that inhabit it. So acknowledging this particular relationship is key to articulate what fair, inclusive, and democratic will mean in a transition process. Finally, the third uh, lens was that of community sovereignty. Here, we focus on two dimensions that are key territoriality and collectivity. So we focus on communities that are in a territory, understand, understanding the previous definition, and that live in a, with a collective identity and, and history within it. So community sovereignty in this setting is a set of practices through which community decides and acts on its territory. And the, the, the first component of that territory is, is the individual bodies of those people. The prerequisites to do so are different re basic resources, such as water, food, but also affection, education, discussion, cooperation. And the, the, the via the, in which community sovereignty materializes is with practices that, uh, that uh, lead to the development of physical and human, human capacities for its execution. So what are the, the, the preliminary results of, of our uh, uh, travel? We found out that discussing and talking about energy transitions, the communities are not interested in one homogenizing notion of one energy transition. We became aware that there are at least three levels at which communities have thought about what an energy transition can mean to them. First, what they call, or, or we came to call a mining extractive transition aimed at the permanent and most uh, timely cessation of large scale coal mining in Cesar and La Guajira in order to protect the life of the communities and nature. In other words, closing the mines as soon as possible. The second dimension, a transition towards energy democratization aimed at fighting poverty and energy inequity of which communities in the country's peripheries have been victims for a very long time. And the third dimension is a broad and comprehensive transition that transcends the energy field and that and seeks to close structural gaps and address historical injustice. What people often uh, told us uh, when, when we ask about energy transition was, what energy transition are you talking about if a woman is, is killed every 17 hours in this country? What energy transition if we do not have water, food, or housing, let alone solar panels or, or windmills? What energy transition if instead of coal, now our wind or our sun or our other subterranean reaches will be depredated? So, uh, the second insight that we uh, uh, got from the, uh, the result is that gender constructions play a very central role in understanding and even changing power dynamics around coal extraction and energy transitions. So women and the territory have been historically constructed as objects of male appropriation and use. Hence, Francis Bacon's literal invitation to enslave nature as a feminine slave that can be understood as a link in a long chain of social construction, leaving profound cognitive scars in people and communities' minds. And uh, this understanding that mining has been casted as a profoundly masculine, powerful, and impos imposing activity. So our research suggests that to doubt any that that, it, that we should doubt any solution that doesn't actively and explicitly question these underlying constructions that are so profoundly embedded in our respective minds, both in the communities and outside. Finally we found out that community already have their ideas, their heterotopias and their resources. They do not seek guidance, imposition or suggestions from outside. They know that their practices are different and that they uh, are fitting their, their concrete context and rather uh, than, than imposition or, or um, uh, help from outside, they search for eye-to-eye -eye solidarity and partnership on their terms and with their priorities. 
Uh, this is an ongoing research and there is plenty of, of insights uh, still to, to collect, but I will finish on, on this moment not to uh, take more time from you. Okay, um, thank you very much, Felipe, and thank you very much for reminding us of the, yeah, of the cultural context within energy transitions take place and also uh, reminding us of how contested they are on the ground and to what extent we need to be very much more aware of any social and social, social cultural aspects. Um, I think that resonates quite closely to everything that Alice is now going to present us um, with a um, focus on interreligious dialogues. So please um, share your screen in case you have any slides to present us and um, yeah, um, very much looking forward to your presentation as well. Yeah, thanks a lot, Francisca. Thanks a lot. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank all the organizers for this invitation. I think it's a very nice combination to hear, Felipe, as uh, what I'm going to present to you guys. It's actually a very much practical experience on the ground on engaging different faith uh, leaders in climate action. Uh, so I, I will use actually my 10 minutes today to explain what is this initiative, how it has unfolded in the past five years, and some of the takeaway lessons uh, we had from that. So Faithful Climate was, uh, as a multi-stakeholder initiative, created on the run-up to Paris. Uh, maybe most of you uh, will remember that by then, Pope Francis released the encyclical Laudato Si, uh, before Paris, and that was a remarkable political move, or to say, on implicating Catholics uh, in joining efforts uh, towards the climate crisis and actually interpreting uh, the severity of the crisis. Uh, at that time in Brazil, we haven't seen uh, big efforts from other religious groups uh, along the same lines. And although the census data from the country set shows that the great majority, as in Colombia and in Latin America overall, is still Catholic, there is a great variety of faiths and religions ranging from Afro-Brazilian candomblé, Buddhism, and many other, and the most the growing diverse Pentecostal movement right now. So our basic questions were, how do different uh, religions perceive this crisis, and how can we have uh, these religious leaders as very effective communicators working side by side with climate scientists in raising awareness about it. So with that in mind, uh, as climate activists, we joined efforts with ISE, the Institute of Religion Studies, uh, that for 50 years have been doing uh, research work and articulation in the fields of religious diversity and its intersections with environment, human rights, and politics uh, in Brazil. Our primary goal was actually to have a joint public statement. Yeah, so to be delivered to the Brazilian government and pressure for more ambition before the first NDC was released. Uh, but then we got it that, but we realized that the potential of this initiative was way greater than that. So which actions uh, we developed throughout these years? So basically uh, four of them. Uh, one is the, this public demonstration and statements, uh, which were very, pretty much politically relevant uh, and already familiar uh, for these uh, religious leaders. Second, some publications and research uh, in journals. Uh, Thirdly, the international uh, cooperation uh, in partnerships in Latin America. So we have Latin American young leaders and this, uh, coming to Brazil uh, to exchange their relationship with the climate crisis uh, and what they could do together. And the Interfaith uh, Rainforest Initiative that uh, talks about not only deforestation, but the relationship with hydropower plants uh, development in the region, for instance. Uh, and some this offline, online and offline exchange between the science and religious circles that I will talk a little bit more in soon. So, which were our lessons learned and how would, could that be useful, for instance, to discuss energy transition in the region and with different uh, religious leaders? First is that uh, water and justice are the common ground through which these different religions understand the climate crisis. You see on the right um, this very nice uh, synthesis of how, which are the keywords for different religions on understanding the crisis. 
maybe it's kind of difficult to read uh, precisely, but this is actually uh, water, all touches upon water and justice. Uh, so to give you an example, a Presbyterian pastor, whenever he talks about the, our responsibility as gardeners that need to pour some water in the garden, uh, he's talking about the climate crisis, understanding the climate crisis through the lens of adaptation and how it draws for him, it's much better, it's easier actually, not better, easier to understand the, the droughts and floods dynamics, which is something much more concrete for them than, for instance, if we talk about net zero or carbon. Uh, so this meaningful dialogue among these religious leaders was really important, uh, I mean, to, to mobilize them, to make sure that they would understand and they would get together in the same page. Um, the second uh, conclusion that was putting climate scientists and religious leaders would improve everybody's communication, climate communication skills. And this was not given actually. We thought that uh, this, there was a kind of taboo to put uh, religious leaders to talk with sci uh, climate scientists because they would say, okay, no, we know already what needs to be done. Uh, don't teach me about you know, religious uh, approaches or something like this, but what's quite the opposite. I mean, understanding uh, the dramatic uh, the drama of the, the crisis, uh, they would actually cross pollinize ways of talking, of communicating about climate very much well in different ways that we would have never imagined. And other collaborations uh, would actually come out of this. So this was uh, also much more effective than for instance, hosting a, a workshop to teach religious leaders about energy transition or, or you know, adaptation or the role of deforestation in climate because they appropriated the climate technical aspects to their own voices much more uh, automatically or much more fluidly. Uh, third, uh, there was a, a, an unexpected result of that, which was the idea that this climate would help people dealing with uh, interreligious intolerance, religious intolerance, uh, because this is, of course, is a very contentious topic. Uh, and sometimes it would be much difficult to put lots of religious leaders on the same page or in the same room to discuss that. But whenever you talk about climate and as they all perceive it from their different lands, uh, the crisis, they would come in. And from then on, they could uh, develop much more other aspects of their, their own political agendas. So I think this was a, a kind of uh, aspect that uh, the climate community in Brazil was thinking, okay, whenever we think about the intersection of climate with other important topics of our time, like racism, like inequality, or even intolerance. So what is our contribution as a climate community to help solving these problems as we are f uh, trying to get their own attention to help solving uh, what we call our own problem. And also in the intergenerational dialogue, because as many of those uh, more powerful religious leaders are in the 50s or late, late 50s or 60s, and many of the climate activists are very young. So this is a, a, a very interesting combination of uh, joint political efforts that would not happen uh, otherwise. And the last one, uh, which is also something it could talk much more on the, the energy aspects of this, is that the interfaith climate dialogues, uh, they have a strong political uh, stances or weight, and it's very, uh, it's a space for knowledge exchange that works quite well. So it's really tough for a political leader to avoid a meeting where you have eight, 10, uh, religious leaders is asking to discuss climate issues. Uh, but at the same time, as these different religions are in very, have very different uh, structures, I mean, financially speaking, and even in the institutionally speaking, uh, to address climate action in practice, uh, this is not probably the best way of dealing or the interfaith space, because then uh, you, you generalize things that would not apply in practice. So there is an avenue to explore, I think, over there, which is how to support these religious uh, leaders and communities, which are, have a lot of real estate, have a lot of challenges, on, for instance, with energy efficiency, 
uh, for instance, with divestment uh, initiatives, other things that uh, in Europe or in the US, for instance, are much more well developed, but in Brazil and in most of the global South is not. So if even the Vatican is, is struggling to put in practice some of the, their climate action efforts, you can imagine like a Candomblé or Umbanda or other initiatives. So yeah. That's it, what I wanted to share with you today. I hope uh, you find this useful and looking forward to the discussion. Yeah, many thanks to you as well, Alice, for um, deepening our insights, our knowledge on interreligious dialogues. I have already seen that two questions have been um, posed in the Q&A, um, and I will take them up later for discussion. I found them both very interesting and very much to the point. Um, so now it's time for me and I will, um, Share my screen as well. Um, just a second. Yeah, so um, hello again. I'm very happy to share research results on the course and dynamics of African energy transitions. And at the first moment, my topic might seem a bit farther away from the two other talks, but I guess our um, common perspective is that we all have an interest in um, greater social and energy justice and thinking about ways in which climate and energy just issues and justice issues can meet with each other. So, um, um, I mean, I'm, I'm leader of a research group which focuses on African energy transitions. So that's uh, the background on which our research has been made. And indeed, it is often overlooked that many African countries have introduced legislation that fosters the greening of the energy mixes and aims at integrating modern clean energy into the national grid. While this is a very positive sign, not so much is known about the content and scope of set policies and especially comparative perspectives are missing. So um, what we want to know is how just are African and how, how just are energy transitions in African countries? To what extent do their policies contribute to distributive energy justice, such as better, better access to renewable energy, both in urban and rural areas? procedural energy justice, like transparent and participative decision-making on energy projects, and also recognitional energy justice, which is maybe the most important dimension, are the needs of vulnerable parts of society taken into account, for example, by social energy tariffs, by meeting the needs for heating and cooling, um, energy for lighting, or um, as a, or a total um, by combating energy poverty. So um, this is why my team has carried out a comparative study, a mapping of renewable energy policies in 34 countries, according to their scope and their contribution to greater energy justice. So this can give evidence how energy transitions are moving forward, what forms of good practice we can find and how this may be related to better realizing SDG 7, reliable and universal access to modern clean energy. So what we did is we, um, yeah, we had a sample of 34 states, all those who have put in place um, substantial energy policies, and we coded the transformative quality of, of a certain policy, like I, it's only single issue direct policies, uh, these integrative policies that focus, for example, on grid integration, or uh, are we talking about enabling policies, which is more comprehensive frameworks, um, auction instruments or feed in tariffs that change the nature of the energy mix and of the energy regime in a wider scale. And second, we focus on energy justice in these three dimensions that I already mentioned, procedural, distributive and recognitional energy justice. And um, in our work, we created an open source database to make sure that everyone can access the data and that all our research is open source avail available. Um, so this is what we found. Um, looking at the transformative qualities, we saw that several countries have already introduced direct and integrative instruments. And we found more comprehensive policy frameworks in Egypt, Ethiopia, Mauritius, Rwanda, and South Africa. 
Resort tendency to um, increase, uh, resort tendency to move towards market-oriented instruments such as auctions or de-risking instruments, and we of course so heavy path dependencies still preventing a faster pace of energy transitions, and this is prevalent in South Africa, Nigeria, or Angola. And regarding the justice dimension, we saw that distributive justice was frequently addressed, for example, by focusing on rural development. We saw that procedural justice was only scarcely addressed, um, but South Africa was a good exception. And we found that recognitional justice is addressed in several programs that, for example, focus on education and training or on energy poverty as a whole, and consider to what extent renewable energy has very strong cross-cutting cross -cutting policy, um, cross-cutting um, abilities. So um, we were wondering, can we find certain correlations? How do the transformative qualities of a certain policy and the normative quality interact? And can we come to, con can we, can we come to better conclusions um, with um, certain countries that may give some best practice example also to others following up on the case of transition? Um, so this is what we found um, when we create a nine field matrix where we have on the one hand the scope of the energy policy and on the other hand the level of energy justice reached. Um, so we have one cluster of state whose policies are comprehensive and meet energy justice criteria. Um, and I will just give a very some brief examples. Um, we found for instance we found the long-term energy strategy from Mauritius, very impressive, um, because this policy framework very much affirms renewable energies cross-cutting qualities, like, for example, by focusing on gender-sensitive energy policies. Um, and Mauritius energy policies include capacity building programs that seek to enhance access for women through microcredit programs. Um, and also we found that they have in introduced electronic payment systems that consider the needs of women whose income flows are irregular. So this is a way to mainstream the gender dimension and to bring in a very strong, very close connection to the ways in which energy policies interact and um, govern, a, govern a transition towards a bioeconomy. On the other hand, in the cluster 1B and 2B, we found a large group of states whose policies do not fully meet energy justice criteria or are just not so far reaching and many of these states indeed find themselves at a crossroads between market-based and justice-oriented solutions. For them, it's still not clear to what extent they uh, focus on a strong state that introduces policy legislation like tax, um, tax programs or energy, sus or energy subsidi subsidies or so. And on the, on the other hand, to what extent states should put more trust in market and mostly focus on attracting more green investment and to opening their market up to foreign direct investment and to introduce energy auctions. This is, for instance, the case in, U in Uganda or in Zambia. Then we also found two classes of states whose policies do not fully meet energy justice criteria, um, where the justice dimension is very scarcely addressed. This is, for instance, the case in Morocco and Algeria, where there are very, very, very successful solar programs and joint ventures yet the social and ecological dimension of renew renewable energy is less considered. And lastly, we found several states where energy justice criteria would need to be addressed much, much more in order to actually tap the cross-cutting potentials of renewable energy, such as combating energy poverty. Um, we came up with several scenarios that um, give some more hints on how to foster this kind of energy transition. In the three countries that scored best in our mapping, um, we still see some challenges. Energy transitions could be considered as a way of jobless growth, where not many sustainable jobs are created, but only short-term job opportunities during the construction phase of solar or wind power stations. Um, there's still a need to further increase energy access, and there's a need to escape existing path dependencies. Um, and here we we always we we also formulated some policy recommendations, and we saw the need to further solidify transition to tap synergies between different SDGs, and also to tackle the policy implementation gap. 
Um, for the many states we found in the clusters 1B and 2B, we see the need to much better be aware how renewable energy should be used, whether renewable energy should be used for rural development, whether renewables should focus on changing the whole production chains, or whether renewable energy should basically attract green investments. So the co-benefits of renewable energy um, on a political, economic and social level should be taken much more into account by the policies. And um, the, the Mauritius framework gave quite some good examples of how uh, something like that can be, can be carried out. Um, so policy learning from best practice examples, some kind of uh, renewable energy policy peer review mechanism could be a way forward. Last, um, thirdly, um, in the case of Algeria and Morocco, we found it very problematic that the justice dim dimension is, some, is not so much addressed. And here we saw the need to encourage public debate about the societal benefits of renewables. Lastly, in the countries where energy transitions are still at the very beginning, we see the challenge that um, renewable energy's benefits are just not tapped in time. And also that many of these countries uh, missing out on um, creating good development cooperation partnerships with development partners. So um, in these cases, we see a need to um, address the situation much more and um, foster development cooperation programs that um, yeah, focus much more on rural electrification, on off-grid solutions, and also on risk mitigations in order to better be able to attract green investment. Yeah, to sum up, what can, what can we learn um, from the policy mapping? What could be done to further strengthen energy justice and just transitions? We have a number of recommendations, both on the government and policy making side and also on the side of development partners. We see the need to um, create um, effective policy mixes to combine auction instruments, vegan tariffs, green funds and green industrial policies to arrive at a very comprehensive um, policy framework. And we see the need to better mainstream energy justice within renewable energy policy frameworks so that it's clear that social aspects and energy transition aspects um, are really matching and that energy transitions are, aren't solely a business case. And on the side of development partners, we also see the need to be better aware of the ways in which energy issues and the whole social, social situation interact. We see the need to arrange some kind of African peer review mechanism for renewable energy policies. And we see the need to better strengthen alignment between the different donors and regional organizations also on the level of energy transitions. So far, so far from my side, I know that's only a very, very br brief overview, but in case you want to read more on that, um, we have a few articles. We have one article that appeared in Energy Research and Social Science um, just a few weeks ago, where we um, yeah, elaborate on the whole issue. And for those who don't have the time to read so much, we also created a public uh, policy brief together with, South, with the South African Institute of International Affairs. So much from my side. Thanks for the attention. Um, yeah, I'll stop the screen sharing again and I now switch back into moderation mode and have a look at what, what has been happening in the chat and everywhere else. Um, so um, I think I'll first pick up some questions that have been raised in the chat already before. And um, after that, we still have some time for anybody who has um, Lift, lifted the blue hand, and I see that um, I've already seen that Zaki Asomaro from uh, RLI wanted to pose a question. Um, but before um, before I have a, um, I have one question um, for Alice. Um, Niels has been asking whether climate change and mitigation is a controversial topic in Brazil and especially in Brazilian religious communities. I guess you already pointed out something on that, but maybe you want to elaborate and maybe there is also some battle with climate denialists. I think that would be very important to know. Sure. Thanks a lot uh, for the question, Niels and, and Francisca. So 
Uh, of course, I can't get a very broad generalization, but I would say it, not necessarily. Uh, it's not a controversial. And even if you're seeing, like, for instance, the presidency, which uh, reinforces its religious identity, uh, re explaining or, or talking about his denialist of climate, that doesn't resonate uh, all the way back to the religious communities. Uh, what we do have is uh, a mixed feeling, especially with some Christian uh, uh, religions, uh, Christian background, uh, that has uh, re deal with climate change in, in a sense of sorrow or in a sense of lack of action. So as if it's our responsibility, but it's a kind of, uh, it's given that we will need to face this. So it's a mix of figures in a way. It's not that mitigation is seen as something that should not be uh, done. And it's not a matter of lack of responsibility, but it's something else. So it somehow uh, touches upon what Sakya also asked on the on a potential uh, contradiction between talking science and, and religions and faiths. Uh, I personally don't see any uh, contradiction on dealing with all of this. And this is what we are seeing climate scientists uh, actually addressing, especially even some uh, IPCC members talking about the role of uh, different understandings to deliver the same message. Uh, so most of these uh, religious uh, leaders don't deny uh, the role of science, but, but quite the opposite. They just try to find a new way of interpreting what is missing because over there, uh, the technical terms for, for instance, if you talk about energy transition, nobody would get it in their daily life. But if you talk about how do we deal with the uh, sun and how, what is our relationship with our resources, then it makes a different way of people to understand. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I think that really that adds very much to the points that have been raised. Um, there was another question uh, focusing on your work, uh, basically um, a statement that by John, John Kerry, Biden's pick for climate, climate envoy. And he stated, President Joe Biden will trust in God and he will also trust in science to guide our work on Earth. So um, what would you what would you what would be your opinion on that? Is it a con contradiction or can there be a match between both views? Yeah, I, I definitely feel that it's not contradictory and it's a match and it's a very uh, clever uh, political move because this is uh, precisely where you get to uh, people to hear you on climate issues if you're not talking only about mitigation or carbon, but uh, if you are talking about, uh, yeah, God's will or so, then you reach uh, much more people than uh, otherwise. So. Uh, I think uh, what we are seeing from this experience in Brazil and elsewhere is that um, science, climate science, uh, do need uh, to develop other ways of communicating it. And the uh, partnerships with religious uh, leaders that are willing to engage in these discussions are very, could be very powerful to shortcut this instead of, yeah, you know, making... Uh, in light of their own uh, climate discussion, uh, more palatable uh, communication. It's actually having different messengers, but that are willing to carry the same message. Okay, thank you so much. I found, I found one question in the chat, which seems to be directed to myself, um, whether during the comparison, um, we had considered whether survey policies only Need to energy ad additions or whether they need to generate transitions beyond fossil fuels. Well, in our case, that's why we differentiate between direct, integrative, and enabling policies. And enabling policies are the most far reaching, far reaching policies. This is normally uh, something like integrated energy resource plans, uh, a long term, long, long term, long scale planning that goes like 20, 30 years into the future and really chain looks at how energy mixes can be changed, how South Africa, for instance, can escape from its fossil path, to what extent it can get rid of its coal power stations. And um, this is exactly what's going on in several states. But of course, in other states, we only find we only found policies that are merely additions, like have some tax subsidies, have some solar lamp programs, have some schools with um, solar, solar cells on the roofs, which is, of course, nice to have, but um, and it also has a, it has a kind of educational merit, but this is not the kind of change in the bigger picture. 
So, um, and this differentiation between direct integrative, integrative and, and enabling policies is a model that we came across in one of the publications by the International uh, Renewable Energy Agency, IRENA. Um, so much as an information, a uh, few more things going on the, in the chat. Um, Pierre Francois has been asking why his question just disappeared, but that's why I already found, um, I already sent the link to that database that he has been asking. Um, yeah, at the moment, uh, the chat is empty. There haven't been any further questions, but um, if anybody um, from our uh, participant is interested in anything, um, anything else, please raise your hand. You also have the possibility to, um, yeah, say something yourself. It doesn't have to be all already always in the chat because then we have a more lively discussion and we still have 12 minutes to go. So anybody who wants to ask something, anybody who would like to say something, please raise the blue hand and I will pick your questions. Perhaps I can I can ask a, a question to, to you, Francisca, um, on your research, and that is whether you uh, came across uh, policies that are, are explicitly aiming to uh, have not only this this energy justice aspects, but further uh, co benefits already within the scope of the of the of the policy, especially concerning the replacement or yeah phase out of, of biomass use in in uh, in, in Africa uh, because I've heard from from other places that it is uh, very linked to a uh, potential uh, reduction of deforestation and other uh, unsustainable practices so just yeah curious about think, that. yeah yeah, I think that that's a very that's a very sensitive and controversial issue how to deal with that kind of trade-offs. And um, after say so far, I didn't find policies that are sensitive on that issue. I mean, there are several policies about biofuel blending and how biofuel could be mixed into the general fuel. But in the policies that we revised, I didn't see um, I didn't see any that um, covered the ecological aspect and the problematic sides about it. Um, regarding co-benefits, um, I mean, in the South Af in South Africa's auction instrument, we, we found very interesting issues, and there has in fact been lots of publications, lots of publications on South Africa's auction instrument because this auction instrument doesn't only um, focus on who is the cheapest bidder um, in a, within an energy auction, but um, every bidder has to fulfill certain socio-economic um, requirements, such as job creation, such as um, social aspects like um, creating opportunities to study en energy engineering at the nearest college or educational needs or um, yeah, employment aspects. And these energy projects in South Africa also need to have a high level of community ownership and about one third of the projects indeed has a community ownership between 20 and 40%, which is already quite a nice figure. So there are, certain co-benefits like that this, that national banks benefit from that kind of energy transition so that social actors benefit. Um, and this is this is actually an instrument which I find very, very, inf very, very interesting one because it's a good combination of investment, uh, invest, investors' interests and also social and social and, and um, national economic interests. And that's why um, so it's in, in that case, it's very clear that energy investment needs to come from outside, of course, but that the state also has certain welfare interests and that the role of the state is made very clear um, in the kind of policy interventions that are done. Um, yeah, so far, maybe as an example on the on the co-benefits bit. Uh, regarding co-benefits, um, I guess you are aware, but I'm not sure if everybody else in the round here is. Um, I think at the Institute of Advanced Sustainability Studies, the ESS is a large project going on, on the, particularly on the co-benefits of energy transitions in, in, the, in the global south. So, um, so there's quite some research going on on how energy policies could also um, support other political, political interests. Yeah, something more happening in the chat? No, only regarding quadrants. Francisca, I, yeah. I would have, 
Oh, sorry. Um, this is Philip. I would have a question. I can't raise my hand as I'm uh, supporting in the background here. <laughs> um, my question um, is to Philippe. Uh, thanks. Uh, first of all, thanks to all three of you for these great presentations and has been a long day already, but I think it's uh, it was worthwhile to to stay to stay awake. <laughs> and um, Felipe, you mentioned these uh, special gender issues in the transition of the coal mining industry in Colombia, and I know that in in your coal exit group you you look at different countries. So, are you also aware of like uh, for me it would be especially interesting to learn if uh, for Germany you would observe similar um, yeah, similar power structure or similar uh, barriers for the transition. H have you looked at this in within your group? Within our group, we, we've definitely uh, looked at that. Uh, my, I think my, my colleague, Paula Valk, is, is uh, uh, joining us in this, in this webinar. She's uh, together with, with uh, uh, Christian Hansen and Isar Fanga. Uh, and others uh, working on that topic, but that is a little bit uh, beyond my own expertise because I, I have a, a more contextual focus on on, on Colombia. And um, what I can say uh, on that is that there are many uh, similarities in in this uh, uh, relationship uh, uh, that it has been constructed towards mining as a mostly masculine uh, activity and nature as a feminine uh, uh, all those persona that, that can be appropriated as, a, as an object of, of, of male uh, desire uh, and, and, and activities. And this is something that at that a very abstract level is common more or less all, all, uh, all, uh, all around. Um, how that leads to particular manifestations of violence or discrimination, for example, varies a lot, a lot according to context. So the amount of, of uh, uh, violence and discrimination that women, especially indigenous and, and Afro-Caribbean women in, in countries like Colombia experience due to those uh, constructions is much more intense than what you experience here in Germany. And I would like to, to continue talking about these contextual factors, but I would uh, prefer to leave it like that and recommend you to Talk with with my other colleagues at the or colleagues group I had for the case in Germany. Yes, thank you very much. And I mean, I can invite Paula if you. I mean, you can just indicate in the chat if you want to add something, and then we can enable you to speak. But I don't want to enforce it. So just write into the chat if you want to comment on this, and then um, we can enable it. Okay, yeah, perfect. Mm -hmm. So we give you Sprecherlaubnis. Hello, Paula. Welcome to the panel. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank you for your question, um, Philip. Um, yeah, we do uh, right now a systematic map on the effects of coal transitions on gender relations um, specifically and on which role women play in different uh, coal transitions. And um, so we yeah, searched in English. So we especially focus on English literature, unfortunately. So we have much information on the effects of coal transitions, especially on the UK and the US, because there was so much, yeah, there's relatively, yeah, quite a lot of literature on this issue in those two countries. So for example, um, the coal transition has the effect on women that um, they um, enter the workforce in a larger extent or to a larger extent, so especially in the service sector, for example. But there's also an increasing workload seen in uh, in, coal, in former coal regions for women because uh, they have to go to work. They have uh, their, still their care work to do. So this is what we, what we see. But I think especially in Germany, so we try to search for more information on the effect of coal transitions on Woman in the Lausitz area, for example, or in the Rhineland, but unfortunately, there's really, yeah, a research gap on this uh, in in Germany. This is what we what we can say. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that information. Um, in the, for the last four minutes, I found an, uh, there was another question in the chat directed to Philippe again. Are there active women anti coal movements and and renewable energy build terms, or were these questions that you rose? 
in, in the research and are women encountering pressure for men and pro coal governmental sites? So maybe you would like to quickly elaborate on that. Of course. What the role of women in the resistance actually is. So uh, I, can, I can tell you, I don't have the specific statistics, <laughs> but women uh, are the, at the for forefront of basically all uh, resistance uh, movements uh, that are of environmental and, and social uh, activism in Colombia most uh, particularly uh, resisting the, the expansion of large-scale coal mining, both in Cesar and, uh, and La Guajira. Indigenous w uh, women organizations such as Fuerza de Mujeres Guayú uh, has uh, been uh, recently very uh, uh, present in the media because uh, together with other organizations, they manage that, that the uh, United Nations Special Rapporteur on Human Rights compel the mining companies to reduce the scale of, of mining. Um, but this is, some, so, uh, this is not only reduced to coal mining. It, it is, reduced, it is uh, the same in other mining activities and in other extractive uh, uh, parts. And it is very interesting. And this is a, an effort spearheaded by the uh, NGO Sensat Agua Viva. Uh, they have been organizing and articulating many, many different efforts to build up uh, bottom-up renewable energy um, uh, solutions uh, that tackle not only energy poverty or energy inequality, but also uh, uh, women empowerment that criticize existing logics of gender, that criticize existing logics of uh, natural resource appropriation and energy use, and that are very linked, for example, to the movements of uh, food sovereignty uh, and uh, uh, environmental justice, amongst others. Uh, to to finish my answer, um, this very big effort that, that many women, but also male-led organizations are, are uh, leading, has so far uh, been responded by uh, an increase in violence and uh, that increase in violence starting around 2016 has so far led to the murders of today. It's like, by, by today, it's 1,000. 10, 1,012 uh, social, environmental, and human rights activists, uh, mostly female, mostly indigenous, uh, afro caribbean and campesino, uh, and mostly in the, this uh, uh, resource extraction peripheries in Colombia. So what, what, that's the kind of pressure they are, they're facing. Yeah, thank you very much um, for your answer and for putting that into perspective. Um, yeah, I'm, yeah, thank you, thank you very much for everybody, uh, for everyone for being here and especially for the three great presentations. Um, or I would, I should better say two because I shouldn't, uh, load my, load myself. Um, but please don't, don't yet go. Um, um, if you would go, you would miss one very important thing for today, for today. Philip has all, has just been preparing the wrap up, the wrap up of today so he will just give us all the summary what has been discussed and achieved during the day and please do not miss this opportunity to get a bet, get a good overview of what has been going on today and also to have a kind of outlook what will be discussed and happening tomorrow thank you very much um, to everyone for coming here and please enjoy the wrap up and i'll just hand over to philip thank you thank you very much francisca and uh, so I can say thank you for your presentation. <laughs> it was really great. And uh, thanks, uh, Philippe and Alice as well. And um, I think you put some pressure on me, uh, like uh, wrapping up the, the full day. And um, I even can't do a uh, complete wrap up as we also had two parallel sessions. But what I can already say is that I think um, we hit a nerve with the topic we announced for this uh, Interconnected Voices conference um, because um, we really have seen that discussions have not focused on like technical implementation or also uh, only slightly on techno-economic issues, but mostly on social issues, political issues, and uh, also on the issue of uh, gender and gender equality. And um, I think this is um, very good to see that um, we were able today to provide a platform uh, which allows um, 
talks on uh, in that regard because um from the from the conferences i've visited in the past and maybe i've just visited the wrong conferences but <laughs> um it was uh, often more based on the um like uh, on technical solutions and um so i think this is the takeaway for today and um what is also a takeaway is that um virtual conferences work so um, it's okay to to save um, emissions uh, to not travel it's okay to make this uh, easily accessible for for people also just to join a special session and um, i think what is also the advantage of an um, online conference is that we have uh, now all sessions recorded and uh, we have more than 250 registered participants already and uh, still we're getting more and more and um, they can uh, take their time until the end of the year to to rewatch the sessions and i think um, that's um, quite good to know for all the presenters that it was not only about uh, presenting today but also you know officially part of the online proceedings you can also put this in your scientific uh, cv if you want and um, this um, will allow further um, knowledge sharing and um, i will close today with an um, with an additional online survey as we started this morning it feels like yesterday already the morning so <laughs> quite an intense day and um, i will uh, share the screen and uh, ask you to go again i put this here in the chat uh, to menti.com uh, so you use a browser on your laptop or on your smartphone and you can go to um, menti.com and uh, type in the access code 5413067 so the access code is um, 5413067 and now you should be able to join i just got the indication that the voting was closed so not sure so please try to go to menti.com and use the code 5413067. Okay, now I can see it. I just needed to reload. Sorry for that. So the question I'm posing is, how do you feel about fighting climate change? so um, i should have asked it in the morning as well so to compare the the influence of the conference on your um, perception of is it uh, very depressed or is it very optimistic and i think we have kind of a nice standard deviation and um, so now uh, there's a slight tendency that it's rather depressing and um, this is already a teaser for tomorrow's program so tomorrow we will have um, a workshop from the psychologist for future talking about what they call climate depression. So I invite everyone, even the ones being very optimistic, and I hope you remain that, um, to join tomorrow's workshop and discuss like this feeling being overwhelmed by this enormous task of battling climate change and seeing that uh, sometimes um, the action is not being taken as we want to see it. But I think this is also part of the conference here to connect with other activists and with other researchers um, to uh, be successful in that. And also tomorrow we will talk a lot about um, climate justice. So um, just to warm up already, I would like to know if you have already an perspective on what uh, means climate justice for you so you can just um, 
type in a sentence or even just one word. And now it's starting global solidarity and support, anti capitalism, inclusion of affected people, participation, rethinking global structures. So I think when I read the descriptions of tomorrow's program, we um, find a lot of these um, words or descriptions included in the in the presentations. And I think what I really want to underline is uh, inclusion of affected people. And uh, there's also someone saying not really sure. So uh, hopefully um, you will have time to join us tomorrow and uh, learn more about different perspectives on climate justice. And then maybe you'll find also your own definition for this. And there's also more burden sharing for the past eco for the economic winners of the past. So yes, this is a great uh, perspective here. And uh, power to the people, including the future generations. And then I read also not only that one uh, that um, one group class is not disadvantaged by change measure towards sustainability, but also the chance to balance social injustice. I think this is again linked to anti-capitalism and solidarity. Wonderful, thank you for, for answering this. And um, as a final teaser and also organizational question, I um, will ask what I did this morning already on um, uh, if you have already decided what workshop do you want to join uh, tomorrow afternoon? Uh, as you know, we have four parallel workshops and um, all four are great. And we just want to check if there's kind of an uneven distribution. And from this survey here, we see that changing energy flow from bottom up will have at least two participants. Then there's the rights-based approach for climate justice, renewable energy and indigenous people. Here we have uh, I think four presenters from different indigenous people groups. Then is this what democracy looks like, looking at the intersection of democracy and climate justice? And, um, and there's also workshop for emancipatory politics in times of crisis, an interdisciplinary approach on multi-level challenges. So for the undecided, maybe you wanna go in workshop four, this would be a nice from an organizational perspective, but of course you're uh, free to choose um, among the topics you're most interested in. Okay, and by that I can um, stop, um, stop the survey for today. And um, we are uh, approaching the uh, real closing of um, today's conference. So um, um, just as a reminder, uh, I share the program as it is in the um, conference tool. So tomorrow we start at 9 a.m. with an uh, opening session with um, a keynote from uh, my colleagues, uh, Sakia Sumaro and Katrin Lammers, a shared keynote on perspectives on climate change, gender and injustice. This will be followed by, there's no climate justice without racial justice from Ime Ituen from the University of Hamburg. So maybe a colleague from, or maybe could, um, the same university as Francisca is based there. And then we have um, Amo Ali, also an Agia member and, um, member of the American University in Cairo on thwarting in a climate change apocalypse through civic narratives. So this will be a very ph philosophical talk. So we follow with an, another session on different perspectives on climate justice. And then uh, we have, as I announced, the dealing with climate repression lecture slash workshop 
from the psychologist for future and then in the afternoon we have uh, four parallel workshops and then uh, we will have a nice festive closing with even a musical contribution um, so uh, i hope you have enjoyed today and uh, i hope uh, we see us all um, tomorrow and if there's uh, any any question left you can also um, address us through uh, the, the organizers through the provided email or you'll find uh, also help uh, on the conference platform and again i can just encourage to enable the networking on the conference platform and um, that's it for today so Thank you very much. And um, you can just uh, uh, write some goodbye words into the chat as I can't uh, see you, but then um, we have kind of a closing goodbye. So goodbye, everyone. It's great um, having you at day one of our online conference and looking forward to seeing you tomorrow.